Good evening. Welcome to the gathering at Scott Memorial. Not a home edition, but Nimmo United Methodist Church edition. Uh, I'm still your pastor, Rachel, and I'm here, not at my dining room table and not at my church because there are like 11 people at my house, and so it's a little crazy chaotic there. And she's at my church. My, hus <laughs> my husband's a lot closer to our house uh, than the gathering is, and on top of that. Francis Asbury preached from this sanctuary. So any opportunity I have to declare the word of God from a really holy, sacred sanctuary, um, I'm going to jump at it. So a couple of announcements to remind you before we dive into today's sermon. Uh, the first announcement is it is a busy week, guys. The youth are camping this weekend, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So join them if you'd like. Saturday night is couples night out. And this Sunday is Palm Sunday. One big joint service out back on the lawn weather permitting. The finance committee will be providing hot dogs and hamburgers. Bring a side. We're going to have one big worship service together, then big egg hunt and all kinds of activities. It's going to be amazing. You don't want to miss it. Good food, good fellowship, good times. I will be there. So join us uh, for Palm Sunday and then Easter Sunday. Our services are at 630 sunrise service and then our regular 9 and 1015 a.m. service. All right. So uh, what brings me joy as a pastor is to be here at our final official sermon of our stewardship campaign. And we've been talking about how to find joy in enough, how to know that we are enough, that we have enough, that we're doing enough. And um, so today I want to talk about, I mean, Marie Kondo like inspired so many people in America to learn how to give things away, to realize they have enough and to let go of stuff. And what she does in her method, I really respect and appreciate. So she says, you know, start with your clothing. Take every item of clothing that you own and put it on your bed and then hold each item individually and ask yourself, does this spark joy? Do not ask, did I get it on sale? Does it still fit? Is it still in style? Did Aunt Edna give it to me for Christmas? No, ask, does it bring me joy? And if it brings you joy, hold on to it. And if it doesn't bring you joy, let it go so it can bring someone else joy. Um, so it's this wonderful approach and it made me wonder, how much differently we would see our lives and our homes if we all, this week, Marie kondo our physical space and let go of things that didn't spark joy. Now, my husband might kill me because um, mops and vacuum cleaners and dirty dishes do not spark joy for me, but those are things I'm just going to have to deal with. Uh, but that this method is powerful, and as a pastor, I thought, how much richer and deeper our relationship with God would be if we did the same thing when it came to our walk with God. If we realized that holding on to anger or bitterness or unforgiveness or resentment, that those things are not sparking joy. They're not bringing us closer to God. Um, so let's let him go and let's embrace something that really will help us get to where we want to go on our journey with God. But then how do we do that? And so again, as a pastor, my mind is like firing on all cylinders, right? And I'm like, well, it would be literally like a never ending sermon to talk about why we find it impossible to hold on to the things that truly matter and let go of the baggage that's just weighing us down. And so I thought a simple way to do it, I don't know if you can see this, but I have a suitcase in front of me and I contemplated the last time I truly Marie kondo the heck out of my life. And it was 15 years ago this month when my husband and I were preparing to leave uh, for the Peace Corps in Bulgaria. And so we were gonna spend two years abroad and we knew that Bulgaria had really, really hot summers, really, really cold winters, that I would be teaching kids somewhere from first to eighth grade. Brandon would be working at the high school. And so in these two suitcases, we had to fit like everything we would need for two years. And we had to let go of a lot of stuff. And so this is actually the carry-on suitcase I took with me there. And it's been my carry-on on every flight since. Um, but I wanna talk about 10 things I intentionally did or did not bring, how they helped me find joy in enough in my own life, and hopefully they can inspire you. Okay, so the first item I wanna talk about um, that I brought with me on the Peace Corps were these, glasses. Okay, so I got glasses when I was a kid and was sick of being called four eyes, so as soon as I was in high school and my parents would let me get contacts, like. I lived and breathed the contact lens life. But in the Peace Corps, I don't know if they didn't sell contact lenses in Bulgaria, if I couldn't afford them, if it wasn't safe to buy them, but they required me to get, I, I think the Navy calls these birth control glasses. And they worked. Brandon and I had no children while we were in the Peace Corps. Uh, so not the most attractive glasses ever, but I needed them to be able to see differently. And when we are embarking on a new journey, when we're learning to let go of things and find joy in enough, we need to see in a different way. We need a new set of glasses. We need a new vision because what the world is trying to sell us and tell us is important 
is not always what God sees. Uh, so for example, I'm reminded of the story of the prophet Samuel, who God calls. He's like, listen, this whole Saul is king thing is not working out. I want you to go and anoint the next king. And so Samuel goes and he's there with David's family and all his brothers, and he sees Eliab and he's like, oh, this is a strong strapping man. I'm sure this will be the next king of Israel. And in 1 Samuel 16, 7, um, it says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so uh, we need to look and see things different, differently to be able to prioritize and realize what is really going to bring us joy in life, what we truly need on this crazy journey of faith. Okay, so the next thing that I packed, obviously, glasses are not enough. You also need clothing. So I packed... Um, Hooker boots, right? They go with me everywhere. And I had to pack clothes for all the seasons, right? So when it's cold out, I had um, this to wear. And when it was warm out, I had this to wear, right? So uh, I tried to pack a little bit of everything to get me through two years of four seasons. And in thinking about the different types of clothing I needed, I was reminded of the words that we read in 2 Timothy 4.2, which says, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage, but do this with gentleness and respect. And um, my friends, we are called as Christians to be prepared in all seasons, to have the clothing that we need for any environment we find ourselves in. Um, not clothing, physical clothing with your favorite sports team on it, um, but clothing like we read about in Ephesians 6, uh, 14 to 15, that says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So if you are truly wearing this righteous clothing, you will stand out in the world because you will do and say things that the world does not understand. And at some point, someone will corner you or say, what is wrong with you? Why aren't you gossiping like me? Why aren't you um, out getting drunk like I do? Why aren't you using the words or the language or the approach or mentality to life that I am? Because we're different, right? We're clothed differently and we have to be prepared in season and out, and out of season to share the reason why we live differently, who God is and how God has transformed our lives. And if you're a member of a Methodist church, my friends, I hate to break it to you, but you took an official vow to do this. You said that you would support this local congregation of, your, of the United Methodist Church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. So be able to witness, not going on, you know, cold knocking on doors and talking to people about where they're gonna go when they die, but being open to share. Listen, this is who I am and this is why. This is the difference God has made in my life. If you were at the gathering last week, you heard some incredible testimonies from some powerful witnesses who were prepared in season and out of season. I did not give them much time. I did not give them much direction, but the Holy Spirit did. And if you haven't heard what they had to share, you need to listen to it tonight or tomorrow at the latest. You can find it on our um, website. You can find it on our app. But um, these were powerful testimonies of people sharing how their lives are different because of how they encountered God at the gathering at Scott Memorial UMC. So wear your clothing, guys. Pack it. It's important. All right. Um, oh, I, the bells, the chimes are going off. Beautiful environment. Okay, the next thing that we have in our suitcase, um, I knew I'd be teaching, right? And little kids. So I brought foam letters. I brought flashcards. I wanted to have the tools of the trade. An education degree wasn't enough, right? I needed fun incentives to get them to listen and to learn with me. And um, I was reminded of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verse 8, where Jesus is sending out his disciples for the first time. And he says, he sends them out in twos, and he says, take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. And uh, it was to teach them to trust in God. If God is calling you on this journey, God is going to provide for you. And while I had all these really fancy, flashy things to teach English, I ended up having like 500 students between first and eighth grade. These were not sufficient for everything that I had to teach and do in the classroom there. Everything I needed was here and it was here. If I had the passion and the heart for it, if I was trying to be creative and engage these kids and think through innovative ways to teach them, that was all I needed. And so often we look around us and we say, God, I can't do that. I don't have the resources. I'm not ready. I don't have the right tools. And God says, I am in your life. I will resource you. I will provide all you need. Just go on your journey and trust in me. 
So wherever God is calling you to go, whatever God is calling you to do, you will be okay if you are obedient to the one who is equipping you even as we speak. Um, okay, so the next thing that I brought with me, it's actually three things, and they were all, they're all tied together because I was trying to teach about American culture to all the Bulgarians. So I brought like fun stickers. They don't have a ton of stickers over there and what kid doesn't want a sticker? And a photo album with pictures of my family, friends, uh, scenic shots of the US and chocolate chip cookies because apparently Eastern Europeans don't really do the chocolate chip thing. Um, and I found between these three things, the stickers may look glitzy and uh, glamorous, but they faded so quickly, right? You give them out to a kid and within a few days, um, they, you're lucky if there's even any part of the sticker left or just the residue um, left behind. And so it reminded me of how so often we prioritize so much of our lives by what we see right here in this moment around us. Instead of thinking of the bigger picture, thinking of the fact that um, we are part of this kingdom of, of God that is eternal and this glory that we cannot see now, but is a part of who we are and who we will be for all of eternity. Hebrews 13, 14 says, for here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come, not stickers that will fade and um, get misplaced and be destroyed, but something more long lasting. I want my life to be built on that. Um, and the photo album, it was nice, cute, fun, right? A good conversation starter with the Bulgarians. But the problem was they were looking at these pictures and they're like, I, I see this person, I see this place, but I don't really understand it until it comes to life. So when my parents came out to visit, when Brandon's parents came out to visit, uh, it changed everything for them because they weren't just pictures on a page, they were real life people and they could watch how we interacted, how we laughed, the stories we told. And my friends, it reminded me that when, um, when it comes to the Gospel of John, the first chapter, we read that God said enough is enough. I can't keep showing people a photo album. I need to send them my love, my grace, my presence in the flesh. And so Jesus took on flesh and dwelt in our neighborhood, came and showed up so that we would know and see and understand more deeply and more profoundly what all this was about um, as he showed and lived into the grace and love and truth that he taught us all. Surprisingly, one of the best things I brought with me to Bulgaria were the chocolate chips. When we first got to our apartment, Brandon's like, oh, let's make the cookies this weekend. And I was like, no, we only have one bag and we have two years. We have to wait until the right time. So the, a couple months into our time there in Lone, Bulgaria, we were really homesick. And so I did make my first batch of chocolate chip cookies and just the smell of them baking in our little Bulgarian oven. I mean, it was just like waves of comfort washed over my homesickness and it brought me so much joy. And Brandon and I probably ate more cookies than we should have, uh, but we did share some with our Bulgarian friends and it was powerful because now we weren't alone. We were fellowshipping with other people and yet we had this taste of home um, to encourage us during a difficult time. And my friends, every single Sunday when you come to church, God offers us his, uh, God's form of sacramental, um, chocolate chip cookies, and that is the, the bread and that's the cup as we get a taste of home. And for anyone who has been disconnected from God and God's love and is feeling a little homesick, there's nothing more powerful than this means of grace, than this sacred meal of fellowship and connection to God, to others, to ourselves, that can help wash away um, the loneliness and bring comfort in times of need. So, um, you know, brilliant person that I am, I realized after making that first batch of chocolate chip cookies, <laughs> I could actually take a candy bar, like a chocolate bar, and break it up into chocolate chips and continue making the cookies overseas. So um, the joy, the fellowship, the communion continued even in Bulgaria. Okay, um, so the last, uh, I, I wanna talk about a few more things. I wanna talk intentionally about something that Brandon and I did not bring with us. Okay. Granted, it was 15 years ago, like the dark ages for some of you, but we did own laptops back then. We did have um, smartphones of sorts, and yet we brought absolutely no technology with us at all. No phones, no iWatches, no iPads, uh, no MacBooks, nothing. And so, ready, wait for it. Our apartment had no Wi-Fi. We didn't have to pay for it because we didn't need it. And so we did this crazy thing where we talked to each other. I mean, we were newlyweds, and let me tell you ladies, if you tend to be more talkative than your spouse, as I 
think I tend to be with Brandon. There was no better Amen. way, my husband's sitting here listening, no better way to strengthen our marriage than for me to be, like if my husband wanted to say anything or talk about anything, the only native English speaker in our town of 40,000 people was this one. So we had lots of conversations, um, lots of communication and connection. It was really important and Yay. powerful for us. He was excited. It strengthened our marriage. And it meant that when we did call home, uh, it was expensive, right? So we made every minute count. We said important things, things that cannot be tweeted in 140 characters. And we sent long emails back and forth at the internet club that have become like a journal to me to, to really remember what it was like, what my experience was like, and to continue, continue to learn from it even to this day. So something I did not pack that I'm grateful for is technology. What that means for us is unplug, step away when you're done with, I mean, don't do it right now because I'm not quite done with my sermon. That's a little rude. But as soon as I'm done preaching, unplug, turn it off, connect with the people that you love, do something real and, and incarnate uh, instead of just running away to technology as a distraction for you. So intentionally, we did not bring that, bring, um, anything electronic with us. Now the absolute worst thing that when I told Brandon I was gonna be preaching this way, he said, you better talk about that electric blanket. And um, the electric blanket did not survive Bulgaria. So I have a big blanket here, it, I kid you not, the, the electric blanket took up like more than half of my suitcase, but I was absolutely committed to bring it with me because I heard that Bulgarian winters were cold and there, that there was no central heat, so in my mind, Okay, like keep in mind that I made it through one year of Girl Scouts until I had to camp. And then the whole like dirt bug outdoor thing freaked me out. And I'm like, nope, can't do it. So Brandon's like, how exactly do you plan on surviving the Peace Corps if the Girl Scouts was too hardcore? But I was like, I can do it, Brandon. I have my electric blanket. So when it gets cold, I will not freeze in a Siberian winter. I will plug in my electric blanket when it dips below 60 degrees and we will both be saved because of my ingenuity. Um, so lo and behold, it gets cold one night and I'm like, oh, we gotta use our blanket. And I, I plug it into my converter and as soon as I plug it in, there's smoke, we smell fire. And the lights go out, not just in our apartment, but in the entire apartment building. And when you blow fuses like that in developing countries, the lights don't come right back on. They don't send out Dominion Power to fix it that night or even the next day. And guess who our neighbors happened to be in Bulgaria? The vice mayor lived above us and the judge of the town lived below us. So I got to introduce myself to our lovely neighbors as a stupid American trying to plug in an electric blanket, something none of them ever needed or had ever seen, trying to keep myself safe. And I realized this stupid blanket was so unnecessary, but it was me holding on to my fear of discomfort, of, of suffering or some type of pain that I was just afraid to endure. And so often, my friends, we lug around stupid blankets um, thinking that it's actually gonna fix the problem when it ultimately ends up leaving not just us but those around us in darkness as well. Um, we can read some scriptures that talk about what suffering means for Christians. And in James 1, 2 to 4, it says, count it all joy. Okay, count it all all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So if you want to lack in nothing, then you need to count it joy. You need to celebrate when you meet trials because they strengthen you. They make you gritty. Because I could survive Bulgarian winters with just a little space heater, I could survive the last four Sundays at church when we had no heat, right? Piece of cake. I can count it all joy. I know I can survive things like that. Uh, Romans 5, 3 through 4 says more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. So please hear me, friends. I am not saying that we need to go looking for suffering, running to pain and suffering. Here I am, here I am, I'm gonna find you. No, but when suffering and pain and discomfort come your way, because I guarantee you they will, don't run from them, run through them. Because we serve a God who knows what it's like to suffer and be in the most excruciating pain possible. And just as Christ survived that victoriously, Christ offers us the same victory if we lean into our faith and trust in a God who will carry us through to the other side. Um, the last two things that I brought with me that I'm so glad that were probably the most important things that I brought were um, my Bible and Brandon. Brandon, uh, come say hi. No, 
you don't. Right. He's okay. He is there. I didn't have him in church today. To pull out of my suitcase. Um, so my Bible and Brandon were tr- like totally crucial because when we went over there to Bulgaria, you know, we both knew that we were called to be pastors, but we didn't know um, how to plug into a local church there in Bulgaria. Oh, there you are. I love you. I kept her warm at night. By yeah. The way. <laughs> okay, stop. Um, So we're in this foreign land, and we were excited to learn more about the Orthodox Church. So we went on our first Sunday to the local um, church there in town, and I was like, wait, we don't know Bulgarian yet. We're not going to understand anything. And lo and behold, we did not understand much of anything. So you know me, right? I'm the nerd. I love my languages. So I'm like, I am going to learn Bulgarian, so all of this will make sense. So I, I become like proficient in Bulgarian, and I go back to church only to find out they use like the old Slavic language in worship. And so I still couldn't understand anything they were saying. And so I was like, okay, Brandon, we have to have another alternative. So we Googled Methodist churches in Bulgaria. Lo and behold, there are some. Uh, We decided to go to the capital city of Sofia to church there, but it meant waking up at 4.30 to get on a train at 5.30, to get to Sofia by like 9.30, 10, to rush to church, which started between 10 and 11. As soon as church was over, we had to hightail it back to the train station um, so that we can hop back on a train and be home by 5.36 at night. So it was like a 12 hour plus process and it was exhausting. But let me tell you that very first Sunday when we walked through those doors and we found a seat, I loved it because some Bulgarians were like, those Americans are sitting in our seat. And I'm like, oh, Everyone feels like they own their seats, they own their pews, it's an international thing. But the first time that um, we prayed the Lord's Prayer together in worship, it was so powerful. I understood it. I could pray with them, and I felt so connected to God. But outside of that, so confession, because that was a hard and arduous process, Brandon and I did not go to church every Sunday while we were in Bulgaria. So that's where this Bible and my best friend became crucial, because my first sermons, his first sermons, were preached to each other in our apartment every Sunday as we turn to the word of God and to each other. And um, we looked at a scripture from Matthew 18, 20, which happens to be the scripture where I got the name for the gathering church, um, which says, for where two or more are gathered um, in my name, I am there in the midst of them. And so we were gathered together in, in Christ's name and we really felt the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit with us. Uh, even though we were separated more than we wanted to be from the church for those two years. So I don't know what your story is. I don't know if you found joy enough. I don't know where you are on that journey, but I do know that if you're not turning to God and turning to fellowship from other Christians to walk alongside you and help you stay connected, that you are truly missing out, that you're carrying the wrong things. You're not packing the right tools with you. So um, I hope you guys have a really amazing evening. Thank you so much for joining me on Facebook Live, and I will see you at the gathering at Scott Memorial UMC 1015 next Sunday. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great night.